I would love to ask you, please, to go back into the First Thessalonian letter. This time, our focus will be at the end of that letter in the final 10 verses or so. So if you are headed towards First Thessalonians chapter 5, then you're in a great spot for what we want to do together. Uh, I don't really consider tonight's study as its own sermon or in any way separate from what we did today. We just kind of ran out of time this morning, and I want to finish the letter where the author finished it. Uh, we're trying to get a feel for what the Thessalonian letter is about. I think that there are a lot of connections between that church and our church. The idea of uh, not divisive, have not lost our first love. We just need to make sure that our faith, hope, and love are growing and increasing. And so I want to kind of get back into the way that it finishes. I presented this graphic earlier, and this morning kind of picked that a little bit, not not the actual photo of Paul, but one of the things I think about when I'm studying scriptures more now than in my younger years is what was the author trying to do in this letter? You know, it's okay to take a verse from Thessalonians and a verse from Ephesians and a verse from Zechariah and a verse from Genesis and kind of put them on a sheet of paper and go, ooh, there's a great point. I think I'll preach that. That's okay. I mean, that's usually all right. But you know what's better than that? What's better than that is where was he going with this entire letter? Like, what was the theme of it? What was he trying to accomplish with it? And as we get to the very end, I just had this feeling this week that Paul might show up one day and you go, you know, I ended that letter really well, wouldn't you think? So why didn't you tell everybody that? Why didn't you tell them that I started with faith, hope, and love and built out what that looks like and then I gave them seven sentences to live by? And I'd be like, Paul, I only do three-point sermons. Seven sentences is a lot. And he'd be like, they can handle it. So that's what I'm banking on tonight is that you can handle seven sentences to finish and you can think about why he chose to do that. I'll make kind of a deal with you. I will not excavate these seven sentences, seven points. I will not excavate it in great depth. We will not spend all night upon it. But I printed it out for you on the back table, and I want you to pick it up. Just take it home and think about this series of things that Paul wants you to consider as an individual, as a family, and as a church. So before we get into that, this is just a very quick quick recap of what we did today. It's all there. We saw in chapter one, he said, here's what I see when I look at you. I see people who have a faith that wants to work. You have a love that wants to labor. You have a hope that wants to be steadfast. And I'm expecting you to grow in those things. So here's practically what that means. Here's what we see on the right. It means we're going to have to keep turning from idols. We're going to have to find out what's getting in the way of us and God, and we're going to have to remove those things so that we can devote more attention to prioritizing one another. That's kind of the saddest thing about idolatry. Second saddest thing. The saddest thing is it defames the great name of God. The second saddest thing is while we're drawn to things that don't matter, we usually miss opportunities to help God's people, and then we're going to live for eternity. How do we do that? Well, we look to the Lord. He will fuel your faith, which will fuel your work. So we looked at all that today. Now, that brings us to chapter 5. If you turn there with me, please. I'm going to move those same images over to the left. I want to learn how to increase in my work and labor and steadfastness. And he started the entire letter with faith and love. And now in chapter 5, look at verses 8 through 11. He says, we're of the day, not of the night. We're of the day. So let us be sober having put on a breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. So he goes right back to those three themes. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we're awake or asleep, we will live together with him. That is when he comes, whether we're alive or we've passed. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you also are doing. So he returns to that idea. We know we're on the right track with this being the theme of the letter. And then after that, beginning in verse 12 through 22, we get seven sentences. I would love for you to spend some time this week thinking about what your life would look like if your faith and hope and love in the Lord manifested itself in a mixture and a balance of all seven of these ideas. Uh, I get really nervous preaching seven separate things because you're not going to remember them. You're going to remember one or two and then the rest are going to go away. But he put them together because we can handle it. And so I want to make this list and print it for you. Let's read it together. He said, okay, here we go. End of the letter. We request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord 
and give you instruction and that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Sentence one. Live in peace with one another. Sentence two. We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Sentence three. See that no one repays another evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Sentence four. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. That's sentence five. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterances, sentence six. But examine everything carefully, hold fast to that which is good, and abstain from every form of evil, sentence seven. Motivation behind it? May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. May your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you, and he also will bring it to pass. I want to be ready. This whole last chapter and a half is about living for eternity. Jesus is coming back. I want to be ready. I want to live a life where my spirit, my soul, and my body are preserved, where I am not to blame for my sinfulness when he returns. I want to be faithful. What does it look like? So this is what I'm going to do for the next few minutes. This, you get out of here early tonight. I almost promised that would have been a mistake, but I'm really confident. Seven things. What does it all look like? He said, check this out. Number one, you must appreciate faithful shepherds. What is all this? Okay, I got it. You know, I need to remove idolatry and I need to be more attentive to Christians and I need to live. But what does it look like? It looks like appreciating church shepherds, faithful ones who have been selected by us to lead us and guide us and to instruct us. Look at the text again. He said, look, this is how you're going to build up one another. This is how you prepare for Jesus. You appreciate those who diligently labor among you, have charge over you and give you instruction. You you appreciate them. You recognize their authority and they're allowed to instruct you on things and you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. It is a great blessing enjoyed at the Lindell Church and not at every church to have local eldership and local eldership, to have shepherds who look out for us, who meet and discuss us, who meet with us, who reach out and try to encourage us. And part of being someone who understands all of what this letter is doing is understanding that you need to submit yourselves willfully to that leadership. There's another verse. We won't do this with every one of them, but there's another verse that's so helpful to this. Hold your finger here and go to the end of the book of Hebrews. The Hebrews letter ends very similarly as well. It's filled with all these encouragements and instructions and ideas. And then when it gets to the end, he says, listen, Hebrews 13, verse 17, obey your leaders and submit to them for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. It is not easy to be an elder of a local church. It's a very thankless job. Paychecks are good, but that's all. There's no paycheck. There, biblically, there could be another sermon. But they're taking charge for the souls of you and your family. And you have to accept the fact that that means they're going to give me instructions. They're going to tell me what they expect. They're going to ask me to participate and help and be a part of it. And understanding what it means to live with work and labor and steadfastness, go back to our text, is understanding 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, that I am submitting to leadership and authority. If you're looking for help in accomplishing that, think about how we built this thing this morning. You've got to go back and look at the Lord Jesus. Hebrews 13 verse 20 says, remember Jesus is your shepherd. Like Jesus is the centerpiece and you give him authority over your life and you're thankful for that. Now let it manifest by following the guides that he has established for you. Number one, sentence number one. The Lord has blessed us with a local eldership and local leadership 
and we need to be respectful. We need to listen. And in many ways, we need to submit and be obedient to those to which we've entrusted ourselves. Second thing, short sentence. May, the second one may attach to our relationship with elders. Sometimes it does, maybe. Or it may connect with the verse that's coming next. But the second thing is we've got to live in peace with one another. The Bible says, verse 13, and in many other places to live in peace with one another. The Bible talks about in Romans chapter 12, so far as it depends on you in the context of brethren, in the context of even brothers in Christ. We're going to weep with some. We're going to rejoice with some. But so far as it's under your power, so far as you're a factor in it, pursue peace with every one. A passage we love is 1 Peter 3, where it talks about be harmonious and sympathetic. The text says to live in peace and pursue peace with others. This idea is so crucial, and I'm not sure that everyone is naturally acclimated to it. I think there are some who were raised in households that did not have a lot of peace. I think there were some who don't really activate and get involved unless there's drama, unless there's disagreement, unless there's something to kind of ruffle everything. They don't start rowing unless there's a storm. Do you know who you are? Like, I'll get busy, but not until it gets rough and tough and we have to fight for something. I got a better idea. Why don't we show God that we get it? We get that we have work to do. We get that you love us and there's labor. And we are ready and willing and accepting to learn to love peace and live in peace. What will that require? Any number of things. It'll require humility. It'll require keeping my mouth shut when I want to say something. It'll require a lot of listening and asking questions instead of just pushing the narrative that I want to get what I want. Living these things out, loving your brother is super practical. Here's two reasons and ways to do it. We love one another when we submit to our leadership and we become the kind of people who love peace. You may not know that life. But if you can learn to live with peace and embrace it, it is available among Christians. Go back to our text. Sentence three. There's a reason why we need all this to start coming together. Because Christians need help. Individual Christians in this room tonight need encouragement. They need direction. They need assistance. They need guidance. Where there is drama and distraction and division and arguments, those people are going to get overlooked and we cannot have that. I've thought about in my life, uh, I think I've known about or sort of been semi-connected to maybe five times when churches have, have split or divided. And there's always all these, you know, great reasons for it and all this stuff. I don't know. It's people, everybody argues their position. But when I look back on those divisions and those splittings and starting this church over here, there's only one group of people I think about. I don't think about the group that stayed and the work that they did and how noble they feel like they are. And I don't think about the group that started the church over here and how great they think they are and how they dodged the ball. I don't think about them. I think about the chasm that got created and the humble lowly, needful souls who fell into that chasm while those two sides were fighting. Those are the people I think about. I don't think those two groups understand they're going to have to answer for the, the weaker souls that did not get the strength that they need because there was so much of this going on. This is why this all builds together. We submit to the leadership of our elders so that we can have a place where decisions get made and we settle into them and we're at peace because, number three, because... There's so many people who need individual attention. Look with me in this beautiful, beautiful text. We urge you, verse 14, we urge you, he says, we urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. I think I put on the board here. Yeah, I was kind of toying with the wording this afternoon. Be a faith factor for others. Our elders can tell you if you want to talk to them. Post-COVID days, the world we live in, there may not be a family in this room that is not touched in some way where discouragement has come through their doors, where fear hasn't crept in where things have come up that they've never handled before, where there's all kinds of problems. There are Christians who get off the path. Who will go and admonish them? Not talk about them, not be pulled away from them, but admonish them. Who will cease those who are faint-hearted and not judge them, 
but go and encourage them. Who will see those who are weak, weak in any number of ways, and make the decision to go help? You know what that's going to require? A ridiculous amount of patience, of patience and loving kindness. And those are the kinds of qualities that we need to have. I thought about a song that got led earlier, and it made me think of Galatians 6. Go to Galatians 6. Galatians 6 talks about this very idea of what the work is, what we're here to do, the work of God's people. And we find that there are some individual things in Galatians 6, verses 1 and 2. If anyone is caught in a trespass, and you could replace that word trespass with anything from our text. They're caught in weakness. They're caught in faint-heartedness. Maybe they are unruly. They've actually departed from the way. You who are spiritual, go restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. I don't want to get off topic here, but as a group of people who follow Bible authority, we're all about the law of Christ. You've got to follow the law of Christ. This church wants to be sound. It needs to follow the law of Christ. Okay, do it. Bear one another's burdens. That's what the text is saying. You're going to follow the law of Christ. Bear one another's burdens. You see someone who's down, you pick them up. You see someone who's hurting, you try to help them be healed. We have to get to that. And what I'm prayerful about is that our leadership, our nine shepherds, are continuing to work more in that direction to engage workers in that work. But we need to be a people of peace for that to happen. And we need to be engaged. I would ask you to think about how your work your labor and steadfastness are being manifested in your individual connections with Christians who need you. You are needed. Number four, go back to our text, 1 Thessalonians 5. You say, well, this will work, but then it won't work because sometimes we get sideways. And sometimes we don't like what the other person does. Well, if they're going to be unruly, unruly is not always pleasant. But go with me to sentence number four. See that no one repays another evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. You go, Chris, I'm in, you know, I want to help and serve, but this person did this or they said this or I tried and it went this way. And we get to this point where, where I'm not active in work and labor because the other person doesn't deserve it. The other person hasn't, hasn't initiated the right way. And this text says, don't fall victim to this worldly mentality, this idolatry of self-focus that when someone does you wrong, you do wrong in return. He says, listen, how about instead of returning a mistake with a mistake, you always, always means when someone's treated you right or wrong, always means when the first effort worked or failed, Always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. So he's saying like, this is like Galatians 6.10, for the household of God and for all people. He's starting with the household of God. You go, well, nobody does wrong in the household of God. Yeah, we all do. We all do. And sometimes we do it towards one another. It happens in the home and in the church. Who is the diffuser in the room? Who is the person who goes, look, this guy said the wrong thing. It's all up to me to decide what my response is going to be. We talk about the power of the first response. Now, for this, we do have to take a peek at 1 Peter 3. It's too great. So turn over for just a minute to the similar language in a verse that I hope you're becoming super duper familiar with. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8. To sum up all of you be brothers and sisters in Christ, husband and wife, parent and child, neighbor, adversary, enemy, government. It's all there in the text. To sum up, I want all of you to be harmonious and sympathetic, brotherly and kind-hearted, humble in spirit. Yeah, but what, what about when things go sideways? Not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. We need to be a people who can take the wrong a people who are more interested in the good work that we're doing instead of winning. Uh, I'll give you a quick example that I try to tell myself 10 times not to say, and here I am with my mouth open. But this morning, Summer was making breakfast, and she mentioned something. I'm not going to get specific about it, but she mentioned something. And I just sort of said something back, and I knew it as... You guys know? Do I need to finish the sentence? As soon as I said it, I thought, that's the worst way I could have said that. There's not a worse way I could have said that. 
I wasn't thinking, and I just, and she looked at me, you guys know the look? Not from her, but from yours. Like, no, you didn't. And I thought, I can't fix this. I can't fix it. I just have to sit here and wait and see what she does. And she turned back and stirred the eggs for a minute, and I kind of peeked, you know. And then, I, you know, then you say something nice, like, boy, you're doing a great job on those eggs. And then she turned around with a smile on her face, and we moved through the day. And I just have felt, like, really good all day today, going, Whew. Like, she could have justifiably taken that as, as something really bad, and then we could have, and what would it have done to our whole day? Like, let me tell you about what it means to live faith, love, and hope. Like, there's this sense of just sort of taking the wrong and diffusing it with kindness, and making the biggest difference. So that's sentence number four is, hey, it's not always going to go right. And I'll tell you why you're able to work through that. How are you able to work through when somebody says something, backing away from that example, when somebody says something bad about you, when, when even a Christian lets you down? Like, how, how are you going to weather this storm? We'll go back to our text again, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. You know how we do it? We just live with this ridiculous, almost indescribable, world thinks we're crazy, limitless, immense, and beautiful gratitude. So thankful for God's love. Remember what we talked about this morning? So thankful for God's grace. So thankful for his love. So thankful for his promises. Every day is always as bright as the promises of God. There's hope in it. We're so grateful that we don't have time for the drama that distracts. We don't have time to be someone who, who fights against what our eldership wants to do. We don't have time for that stuff because we're so filled with sentence number five. Are we on five? We're on five. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Aren't those the most annoying people? They're always thankful for something. And there's always some reason to rejoice. And life's always so full of blessings. And you, maybe you know a little bit about their life and you're like, you, should, you probably shouldn't be like that. Like your life's got problems. They don't talk about them or see them in that way. They're just continually optimistic. Let me tell you about those people. If they are sincerely that way, they are following this sequence perfectly. Because the sequence is faith and hope and love in you from God, which makes all of the good outputs possible. And that good output is three words here that have the, this sort of major nature to them. Always, verse 16, without ceasing, verse 17, and in everything, verse 18. This is, of course, a reference or similar reference to Philippians 4 for just a moment because we know it. I want you to see the emphatic language that is also there for a moment. So look in Philippians chapter 4. Rejoice in the Lord when people treat you right. Rejoice in the Lord when the leadership makes a decision that you wanted them to make. Rejoice in the Lord all ways, verse 4. He was in prison when he wrote this, by the way. Rejoice in the Lord always, again I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be made known to who? All men. Your spouse, your boss, everybody. Why? The Lord is near. It's driven by that. It's driven by the presence of the Lord. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, emphatic language, always, all men, everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Number five, limitless gratitude. One of my favorite things to do in the morning is level three gratitude. Just write something I'm thankful for. Write a couple sentences about how God is responsible for all of it and write a final sentence on what I'm going to go out and be or do today because of it. That's a staple of my life. And I would encourage you to start your day in that same way. Back to our text. Two more sentences. Do not quench the Spirit. This is an interesting one because there's a couple of ways of looking at it. Do not quench the Holy Spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterances. When you talk about quenching the Holy Spirit, it made me think a little bit of Ephesians 4 where it talked about like despising the Holy Spirit by having a poor attitude. I mean, the Holy Spirit's attitude is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. So if I go out and I don't exhibit any of that stuff, I'm, I'm sort of sort of offending the Holy Spirit. But here, because of the second phrase, I think it's more along the lines of what I've given you here, which is give attention to the Spirit and His revelation. 
Do not quench the Holy Spirit. What do you mean? I think he means do not despise prophetic utterances. And in some ways, it's just a simple point I wanted to make about reading the Bible. But more importantly than that, I want you to see that it's what the Apostle Paul wants you to see at the end of this letter. The Holy Spirit is trying to help you through all this. He's trying to give you perspective and wisdom. He wants to make promises to you. He wants to tell you that he's in you. He wants to tell you that Jesus is with you. He wants to tell you what this is all about. He wants to tell you how short it is. He wants to tell you how to live it well. He wants to tell you where we're going. He wants to tell you all that. And this book is an accumulation of the things that he wants to tell you about all of what's going on. And I just don't see it. I don't see how we can ever become who the Holy Spirit has designed us through God to be if we're not spending time every day reading the things the Spirit wants to tell us. To me, personal point, when I read this verse, despising prophetic utterances is really easy. Watch, ready? That's how I would do it. I'd say, I don't, I don't need that. I don't need it. I don't like it. It doesn't fit the narrative. It doesn't fit my life. That, to me, would be despising it. In their day, it was a little bit more complicated than that. In their day, there were prophets who were inspired by the Holy Spirit. And in 1 John 4, we learned that they had to kind of measure them. They had to go, wait a minute, now which one of you is, one of you, is, your messages aren't the same. So which one of you is actually the Holy Spirit and which one isn't? And there was some cool stuff there about how only one of them would truly be able to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. It's really cool. But in the end, they had to kind of measure it. Well, thank God that we don't. We have it. We don't have to weed out what doesn't belong. So I would simply encourage you there that if you're looking for some motivation, you can kind of work your way up this list. Like if I'm in the word, letting the spirit work on me over here, then it's going to make me grateful. And as I'm grateful, my attitude changes and everything works its way up. And then lastly, last thing here, we'll finish in our text. Go back to First Thessalonians 5, seven things. Not usual to make seven points, but here, this is the way he ended the letter. He wants us here. There's something about how all this works together. And so he finishes with, and this has to do with prophetic utterances to some degree, but he finishes with examine everything, examine everything, hold fast to that which is good and abstain from every form of evil. He says that a lot. It's in a handful of the letters. It's one of his sort of central ideas is, you know, when you really get to this, life is filled with choices. Romans 8, there's the flesh and the spirit every day. Do I choose the flesh and what it wants? Do I choose the Holy Spirit and what he wants and what he's taught and who he is? And you have to make those decisions day in and day out. He says, listen, this is serious stuff. So you examine everything. Now, by everything, he may mean all the different prophetic utterances that were coming in. But I consider this more broad than that. You examine everything because some things in your life are going to be idolatrous and evil. Remember this morning? It can be idolatrous things that you think are fine and you can't find a verse to say that it's sinful, but it has completely replaced God in your life. Examine that carefully. Examine that very, very carefully. Because some things need to be moved into the realm of don't belong because I need to hold fast to that which is good. And the Bible talks a great length about that throughout the scripture. So that's it. See, I told you that that was it. I want you to pick up this sheet in the back and it's not my sermon. These aren't my points. Nothing I've taught you today came from a guy sitting down at his coffee table trying to figure out what he wanted to say. This is just what this letter is trying to convey to a good church that has the potential to be a great church. Greater, I guess would be the better way of putting it. Now, if you're looking for motivation, I want you to read verses 23 and 24 again. 1 Thessalonians 5. You're looking at this going, I've got some of this down, some of it not so much. You need to work on a few of these things. Listen, God wants to help you. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. May your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Use the promises and the love and the grace of God to fuel it. I'm just going to show you one more slide. And I'm just going to move it over. It's all I did. I just moved. I want you to remember these. Everything we put over here kind of is categorized as the stuff on the right. I mean, it's, it's the real stuff. It's the, it's the life you're living, the choices that you're making. But it has to be fueled by the stuff that comes in before it. And that is that which is of God. Personally, I, I'm not going to present it too much for you, but I've been working through this going... The reason why I'm going to respect my elders is because of the great and wonderful love that comes to me from the great shepherd. I'm going to use that in order to do this. Number two, the reason I'm going to seek peace is because Christ has brought peace into my life. I'm living a life of peace. 
And so now I'm going to take that peace that I'm living and I'm going to demonstrate it to others. You know, I'm going to be a faith factor for people. You know, I want to be an encourager because he encourages me. He is with me always. He lifts me up. He hears my prayers. Grace is where everything gets motivated. You know why I'm going to respond kindly and constructively when someone does wrong? Because if God didn't do that, I'd have been incinerated a long time ago. I'm still alive because he is patient with me and on and on throughout this list. He is enough. He is enough to change your entire life. He is enough to renovate your heart to renovate everything about how you feel and how you live and who you are. And when he is enough and he changes you on the inside, everybody around you gets to benefit. That's the sequence. Do you need him? Do you need his encouragement and his help? He's got a lot of good work for us to do. I'd love to learn to do it with you, but we're going to need his help. If you need encouragement in Christ Jesus, then come at this moment as we stand and sing.